All right, so this is a brief introduction to the Excel sandbox that is available in um, on Moodle for you guys. Um, let's start at the far left-hand corner down here in the bottom. You'll notice there are four different tabs on here. One for correlation, if that's the type of effect size you're doing, one for odds ratio, one for standardized mean difference, and another one that is the Wilson PowerPoint example that we've been sort of working with as we've been going along. So first let me just introduce you. I've sort of color-coded things so you can tell what goes where. Basically on this huge spreadsheet, the only thing you do is fill in data on those cells there. So it has room for 15 studies. That's how many you should have um, in your um, for your group project. So it has room to put in data for 15 studies. So I just noticed this one actually only has room for 14 studies, but I will fix that because row number one actually has the uh, labels in it. So I'll fix that. Um, and so the yellow cells are ones you actually need to do data entry in. Once you've entered data in those, you will notice that the rest of this row will automatically update and do calculations. See, we had an end size of 200 and a correlation of 0.33. It automatically calculated the variance for R and the standard error for R. Then it went ahead and converted it to a Fisher Z. We have our variance for Z and our standard error for Z. And then it also calculated, as we just talked about in the previous video, um, it calculated the weight, the weight times the effect size, the weight times the effect size squared, and the weight squared so that it can calculate everything we need for our fixed effects model. So once you've entered the data, it will automatically go ahead and calculate all of these numbers down here. So you can do the same thing. You could enter data for odds ratios. For that, you need your treatment events. Um, if you're looking at, say, recidivism, you would put in the number of times someone reoffended in your treatment event column. Then you'd put in the number of times they did not reoffend in your treatment non column. You'd put in your n size in your treatment n column. So this is should these two numbers should add up to that number. And then your control group, the number who had an event had reoffended, the number without an event, the number who had not reoffended, and your overall n. And then all of the rest of these columns will do exactly as they did on the last sheet. They will automatically create and input all that data and create your fixed effects model down here. We'll ignore the random effects model at this point. All of this stuff is based on the log odds ratio, but most people actually work with just the regular odds ratio. So this will convert it back for you into the regular odds ratio. The pink ones are for the fixed effects model and the orange ones are the converted back into odds ratio for the random effects model. We'll ignore the random effects model for today. Standardized mean difference. You're going to need your treatment mean, your treatment standard deviation, and your n. Your control group mean, control group standard deviation, and n. Which should all be the pieces of data that you're collecting anyway. It should be very easy to put in, and it will do the same thing, and automatically compute all of that data and give you your fixed effects model down there. So let's look at the Wilson PowerPoint example. Before we go back and look at the Wilson PowerPoint example, let's go ahead and pop back to the correlation where we needed to add um, in a row. One of the things you'll notice is that some of these cells are blue. Any of the blue cells are ones where if you change something in there, you actually have to update the formulas. So this one right now is the sum of J2 through J15. It's the sum of all of these numbers. You want to make sure that that stays J2 through J15 or will now become J2 through J16 when we, when we add another row. So you just want to make sure that that is working. Same for this one. It's the sum of K2 through K15. Sum, sum. Just the sums of each one of those rows. This one's a little bit trickier. It's 1 divided by G2 plus K28. So it's going to be the G for this row plus K28. Where is K28? Well, let's look down K till we get to row 28, which is our T squared value. So we want to make sure that this formula ends up with the uh, variance for the Fisher Z plus T 
squared. And that one is the trickiest one to deal with. Let's go ahead and add in another row. Insert a sheet row. Does that, we can go ahead and just take all of these formulas and we'll drag them down. Most of them will work out just fine. So you can tell these are doing what they're supposed to be doing. This was one divided by G13. Our new row, it's one divided by G14. Perfect, that means it updated for that row. This one, we can tell all the rest of these have a negative four, six, two, six, eight. And this one looks off. That's because now it's taking it plus G30 and it should be plus G, uh, sorry, it's taking it uh, plus K30 is what I meant. And we actually want it to be K29. So we need to go in and just change that to G14 plus K29, because it needs to be adding in that T squared value. And instead it was adding in a different value. It assumes that when you add a row, all the numbers are gonna bump down one, but that one we don't actually want it to bump down and be different than the rest. We want that particular value to be the same for every single one of those cells. For every one of them, we wanna add T squared, not different numbers. And then if we go ahead and click somewhere, it'll update. How oh, that looks much better. We just wanna check these, make sure they're doing the right thing. J2 to J16, two through 16, two through 16, perfect. And this one, This value should be the number of studies we have minus one. You can do something like um, the count of J2 through J7, except this should be J2 through J16 minus one. That should work for us. We'll go ahead and press enter, 14. Perfect, because it should be the number of studies we have minus one, which we have 15 studies now, so 15 minus one gives us 14 and that is working. So that's how you'd add in a column. So if you guys ended up coding 16 studies instead, that is the process you would do. The main thing you need to do is make sure to change the formula for this weight and make sure to change this degrees of freedom formula. Once you've added in a row, you can just highlight the um, cells in the row above it and drag it down by using this little square here in the corner and that'll drag those formulas down to the row if they're empty once you add in a new row. All right, let's pop over to the Wilson PowerPoint example. All right, so we have, in that one, they have 10 studies that they were looking at. These are the G values we've been talking about. We had some really low ones, like our zero. And we noticed that we had some fairly large uh, weights. Um, this one must have had a larger um, end size than a lot of the other ones, with its weight being 58. This one even larger at 83. Um, we've gone ahead and we have calculated all of the weights and all of the things we need in order to calculate our effect. So our mean effect size is 0 0.1549, 0 0.15 if we go ahead and round. And our standard error for that is 0 0.06, 0 0.09, so we can round that to 0 0.06. Our upper and lower confidence intervals do not cross zero. They're 0 0.03 to 0.27. So we know even without looking at the next cell down that that one is going to be statistically significant at a 0.05 value because it has not crossed zero. And it indeed is. So our P two-tailed is 0.0109 or less than 0.05. It's not less than 0.01. It is greater than 0.01 by a hair, um, but it is definitely greater than 0.01. But it is sig statistically significant at um, a at a less than 0.05, at an alpha of less than 0.05. So what does that tell us? That P, all that tells us is that overall, this mean effect size that we have, our 0.1549, is significantly greater than zero. It is not zero. That's all we know. There is some effect going on here. So overall, whatever it is we're looking at, whatever phenomenon we're looking at, does have an effect and it's a positive effect. Despite the fact that a couple of our effect sizes were negative, overall, this phenomenon we're looking at has a positive effect. So down below, we have our measures of dispersion. Um, we have Q, we have the degrees of freedom, and we have T squared. Um, 
C is just a number we need to calculate in order to calculate t squared. You'll see that it is currently in G23, that is what cell this is, and so that's just part of the formula. It's the denominator for the t squared. Um, so you don't have to pay a lot of attention to that, we don't tend to use that um, as part of how we describe the statistic, it's just a number we need to calculate. Um, Q is one of the most commonly reported uh, values um, in addition to the mean effect size when we're looking at meta-analyses. Um, but we also get t squared and sometimes i squared. You'll learn more about both of those in your book. One of the ways to look at Q is simply to compare it to its to the degrees of freedom. We'd usually like Q to be less than the degrees of freedom. Um, and in this case, it is not, it is greater than that. Um, so there appears to be some dispersion in our effect sizes. And we'll, I suggest that you read over those chapters carefully in your book. This is just a quick introduction to how to use your Excel sandbox in order to calculate your data for your groups. Um, One of the things that I would suggest doing is playing with the data in here to get an idea of how all of these things interact. What if um, this effect size was instead of negative 0.33, what if it was positive? What does that do to the rest of this information? It dropped our Q by a bit, it upped our effect size. What about this one? This one, this one had the largest uh, weight. So what would happen? Oh. Sorry. What would happen if we changed this effect size? It really wants me to enter something in that cell. I'm trying to move from that. There we go. What if we changed this effect size to a positive? What does that do to the rest of that? That changes it quite a bit again. So go through and play with these numbers. What happens if we change those effect sizes? Put data in to these cells. Um, just randomly make up some data or use the initial data you're getting out of your group. Put it in there, add in other data, and play with it. What happens if I increase this end size or decrease that standard deviation or increase these means? Or what if all the ends were equal? Or what if they're drastically different? What happens to all the rest of the values? So play in here a bit. Um, especially once you've got some data entered, just to get an idea of how changing things there impacts the rest of it. And that helps you understand intrinsically what all these different values mean. What does Q really get at? And what things can I change that are going to change my Q value? And that helps you understand not only your own data, but when you're reading meta-analyses and they have a large Q, then you can sort of imagine what their data must have looked like. Would those ends have been really disparate? Would those effect sizes have been disparate? What combinations of those tend to lead to um, larger or smaller Q values, etc. So get in there and just play around with this Excel sandbox. And I will see you guys next week.